Well, hey, Renewed Life Church, the video from this past Sunday, uh, January 23rd, um, got messed up in recording. Something happened to it. Um, it's actually just a, a complete mystery as it is. Um, but we, we wanted to re-record this because we believe that the, the content of the message is so important. It's so vital uh, to a young church plant like Renewed Life Church. It's also just so vital to the church as a whole right now. So we wanted to get this out, this series that we've been going through, First and Second Timothy called Remembering the Goal, has been just an amazing, challenging series. And this sermon was titled, When the Spirit Speaks, and it's, it's from First Timothy chapter 4, and the first five verses only. Uh, simply put, when the Spirit of God speaks, we need to listen, right? We need to listen when the Spirit of God speaks. And what we're going to look at real quick is what the Spirit says about later times and why those later times mentioned by the Apostle Paul in this passage are here and now. And we're going to look at what the end times we are living in actually look like. And here's a, a question that, that I hope will challenge you, that I hope will help you take in uh, the word that we're going to hear today and really just challenge you to, to move on your spiritual journey. The question is, do you know the truth from a lie? Do you know the truth from a lie? And the key to identifying the lie, any lie, is to know the truth. We have to be taking in the Word of God to know the truth found in His book. When we look at uh, you know, counterfeit currency, we don't look at counterfeit currency to figure out what counterfeit currency looks like. No, we study the real thing. We study the truth. We study the real dollar bill. It's no different with the Word of God. Do you know the truth from a lie? Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the Word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The living Word of God is defensive and it's offensive. It's a weapon. Scripture says the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. So we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. And we need to be filled with the Spirit in order to discern His voice from the deceptive voices of Satan and his demons, his minions. Ephesians 5.18 says, Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to, to reckless living. That's opening yourself up to deceptive spirits, to the voices that are not God, that are not from His Holy Spirit, that are not from His Word. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to, to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. If we are being filled continually with the Holy Spirit, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. Galatians 5, 16 and 25 says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. And then in verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit leads us into all truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the Word who became flesh. This book this Bible is the living Word of God and is how we as Christians can know the truth from a lie. So do you know the truth from a lie? Would you be able to recognize the deception of a false prophet? So 1 Timothy chapter 4 in your Bibles. And before we get started, I just want to pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can come to you, even in this manner, re-recording a video that we lost so that we can get out content, so that we can get out a message that is from you, that is from your word, that is from your book. God, would you just bless this and allow those who are hearing it, allow those who are receiving this to be challenged by this so that we can, we can really begin to understand if we can tell the truth from a lie. So God, just open our hearts. 
lead us and guide us in your word. Fill us with your spirit even now so that we can, God, just be led and guided into all truth so that we can know you and draw closer to you. God, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this technology that we can just do this. God, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in the first verse, it says, Now the Spirit explicitly says, and I want to stop right there. Now the Spirit explicitly says, I want to do a couple of word studies real quick. Explicitly means in a clear and detailed manner, leaving no room for confusion or doubt. So the Spirit, in a clear and detailed manner, leaving no room for confusion or doubt, says. That word says is important. We can pass over it because we know its meaning. But what I want you to focus on is the tense of that word. And what tense it's in is the indefinite present tense. Indefinite present tense. Always in the present tense. It doesn't matter when it's spoken. In Paul and Timothy's time, or in our time as we're reading it, it is in the present tense. So the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, explicitly, clearly, without doubt or confusion, says, continues to speak, goes on saying. What does the Spirit say? It says that in later times, some will depart from the faith. In later times, and those times are identified by that fact. Some will depart from the faith. How will they depart from the faith? It says, by paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. Where does the deceit and the teaching of this, the, the spirits and the demons come from? Verse number two says, through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. And this is a big deal. Church, this is a big deal and it's worth clarifying in the later or end times, which we will explore further in a minute. People who profess to be Christians by the way they live or what they say will actually depart from the faith, proving they were never Christians in the first place because they will follow hypocritical liars with seared consciences who are allowing demonic spirits to work in and through their lives to produce deceitful teaching. Men and women will actually come into the church, gain an audience of professing Christians, and lead them away by teaching deceitful doctrines that come from demonic spirits from Satan. This was happening in Paul and Timothy's day. And I will tell you, it's definitely happening in our day. As you look around the church, as you look around America, as you look around the world, this is happening now. A quote from a very famous pastor. He says, Satan is most effective in the church when he comes not as an open enemy, but as a false friend. Not when he persecutes the church, but when he joins it, not when he attacks the pulpit, but when he stands in it. Folks, again, this is scary. And an audience in the church today is easily obtained. There are so many different means of technology in our culture. In our current day, we have access to preaching and teaching from anybody that we want at any time that we want through social media, YouTube, Spotify, Vimeo, and on and on and on. Pastors who are actually wolves in sheep's clothing, as Jesus says, are being propped up all the time. And it seems that the more contrary a pastor is to the Word of God, the more popular their church and the larger their following. And I said this on Sunday. A large church, a big building, a multi-million dollar budget doesn't make a church wrong. Doesn't mean a church is filled with false prophets and the teaching of, of demons that come through hypocritical liars with seared consciences. That's not what it means. That's not what I'm saying. But Satan is working to prop up 
false prophets and false teachers and false pastors. And they're causing through their teaching some to depart from the faith. And Paul tells Timothy in, in verse 6 of chapter 4, if you point these things out, Timothy, if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, to other Christians, to followers of Christ, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, nourished by the words of the faith and the good teaching that you have followed. There is an obligation, a responsibility to point these things out to followers of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit in our passage explicitly says that in later times. Luke chapter 17, Jesus gives a good description of what these later times will look like. Luke chapter 17. Starting in verse 22, he says, Then he told the disciples, The days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you won't see it. They will say to you, See there or see here. Don't follow or run after them, for as the lightning flashes from horizon to horizon and lights up the sky, so the Son of Man will be in His day. But first, it is necessary that He suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. First, Jesus, He's saying right here to His disciples, I first must go to the cross. Verse 26, he says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man, prior to the second coming of Christ, prior to Him coming and gathering His church, prior to Him sending the Antichrist and the false prophet to the, to the lake of fire, prior to Him bounding Satan for a thousand years for that millennial time period when we will rule and reign with Christ, prior to all of that, it will be like it was in the day of Noah. Verse 27, people, Jesus says, went on eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. It will be the same as, as in the days of Lot. People went on eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building. But on the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be like that on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Like the days of Noah, like the days of Lot. People went around eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, building, buying, selling, doing whatever they were doing except for being concerned for the righteousness of God. Instead of being worried about needing a Savior, instead of looking to God for salvation that He provided for us through Christ, people went on eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, living, building, doing this life. That's how it is now. They gave no concern for the things of Noah or Lot. There was no, no response whatsoever. And Jesus says that's how it will be. That's how it will be before He is revealed. That's what it will look like in the later times. That's what it will be like in the end times. In the end times, Paul tells Timothy. The Spirit explicitly says... That in later times, some will depart from the faith. And Jesus says in Matthew 24, 12, Because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 18. And John writing here says, Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. By this we know that it is the last hour. It is the last hour. He was telling his readers then. 
It's the last hour. It's definitely the last hour now. Some will depart from the faith, and he describes this in verse 19. He says, they went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belonged to us. There is the test. Some will depart from the faith, proving that they were never part of the family in the first place, proving that they were not adopted sons and daughters of God. They went out from us because they did not belong to us. If they would have belonged to us, if they would have been part of the family, they would have remained with us. That's what John's saying. They went out from us because they weren't part of us. Paul tells Timothy, some will depart from the faith. And they will part, depart from the faith by paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. Some translations say following deceiving spirits or, or devoting themselves to deceitful spirits or, or giving heed to seducing spirits in the King James. Some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits, following deceitful spirits, devoting themselves, giving heed to deceitful spirits. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is, this is big. Paul is addressing in verse 4 of chapter 11, for if a person comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we did not preach, Corinthians, or you receive a different spirit which you had not received, or a different gospel, which you had not accepted. You put up with it splendidly. In verse 13, he says, For such people are false prophets, deceitful workers disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. These false prophets, deceitful workers who have come into the church to, to lead people away, to cause people to depart from the faith, are disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, he says, no wonder, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no great surprise if his servants, Paul says, also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. These false prophets, false teachers, false preachers who are, who are telling everybody, publicly proclaiming they are apostles of Jesus Christ, are actually servants of Satan, disguising themselves as servants of righteousness, disguising themselves as born-again believers, disguising themselves as followers of Jesus Christ, part of the church. We need to watch out. We need to be on guard. The Holy Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. And these deceitful spirits, these teaching of demons, this is how they will come, through an actual individual, a false prophet, a false teacher, a false pastor. Paul says, it will come through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. Through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. This is a severe issue. How does one get to a place where their conscience is seared? Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3.19, He said, People love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They rejected Jesus Christ. They remained in unbelief. Which He explained to Nicodemus, Remaining in unbelief is condemnation. They're condemned already. 
He explained to Nicodemus that they love darkness rather than light. And I don't pretend to know how long it takes for someone's God-given conscience to be seared, but I know it starts with rejecting Jesus Christ. And it starts with falling in love with, having a love affair with this world with sin. Seared in this context means to burn with a hot iron or cauterize. The act of searing would permanently damage live flesh by removing any sensitivity that nerve endings provide. Essentially, what this means is, is it would be numbed or deadened. And these hypocritical liars with numbed or deadened consciences began to spread lies, began to draw people away from the faith. And this is what they did, Paul says, verse number three. They forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods that God created by receiving or to be received with gratitude by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, since it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. They forbid marriage, which is created and ordained by God, and demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received, verse number three, and not rejected, verse number four. And what's the problem with this? Because what these hypocritical liars were doing was rejecting that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. They were actually saying Jesus wasn't the only way to righteousness. They could make their own way by creating a list of rules and getting people to abide by them, and that would somehow lead to righteousness. This is a false gospel. This is departing from the truth, suppressing the truth. Paul says, for everything created by God is good. And this is an obvious reference to the creation story. Genesis 1.31 said, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, and then the morning, the sixth day. God later told Noah, Genesis 9 verse 3, he says, Every creature that lives and moves will be food for you. As I gave the green plants, I, I have given you everything. He gave some boundaries within that and later some more food laws to protect the Israelites. Then in the New Testament, under a new covenant, God tells Peter, get up, Peter, kill and eat. What God has made clean, do not call impure, Acts 10, 13 through 15. What God has made clean, do not call impure. This vision that Peter has is clarified in the revelation that salvation has been opened up to the Gentiles. But God is also identifying what he has made clean. And he's telling Peter not to think of it as impure, not to, not to need ritualistic purification. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be reje rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, since it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. Folks, Jesus accomplished everything for us on the cross. He didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill or fill them full of himself. These false prophets are trying to obtain righteousness and prove that they are better than everyone else by creating a false set of rules. In seeking their own righteousness, they are rejecting the sanctifying work of God through Jesus Christ crucified. They are creating a different gospel. Because of Jesus Christ and what He accomplished on the cross, in the grave, raised to new life, we can believe in Him and know the truth, and receive with gratitude, with thanksgiving, what God has created, since the sanctifying work has been accomplished by God through His Word and by prayer. Colossians chapter 2, 
Verse number four. This passage I wanted to close with. Colossians chapter two, verse number four. Paul says, I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. These arguments sound reasonable. Some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and and the teaching of demons. They're going to come through hypocritical liars with seared consciences and and the arguments they, they present, the doctrine that they present. They'll shroud it in scripture so that it sounds reasonable. Paul says, for I may be absent in body, but I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well ordered you are and the strength of your faith in Christ. So then just as you have received Christ, Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Be careful, he says, that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. And you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. You were also circumcised in him with a circumcision, not done with hands, by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. Therefore, Paul says, therefore, because of what Christ has done, because of what Christ accomplished on the cross, because he has erased the certificate of debt, He has taken away the obligations. He has taken away what was against us, what was opposed to us. He nailed it to the cross. And because he did that, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These things are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. These things will not give you righteousness. These things will not save you. The law will only show you that you are a sinner, that in your flesh, you cannot do anything to maintain or obtain the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ is the substance. He filled full the law. He is our righteousness. There's no set of rules. There's no amount of forbidding or abstaining that will allow you or I or anyone else in this world to obtain righteousness. No amount of good can be done to outweigh the sins that we have sinned against God. We have transgressed His law, His perfect moral code. We are in opposition to Him. And He made a way through Christ. Jesus Christ died for us. He atoned for our sins. He became our righteousness. His righteousness is given to us. And all we have to do is believe in His name. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 10 tells us, If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that He, God, raised Him, Jesus Christ, from the dead, we will be saved. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. When I was seven years old, um, I remember my dad sitting in our living room. On a Wednesday night, he was sitting in our old 
a wooden rocking chair. He was getting his shoes on, getting ready for our Wednesday night church service at the, at the church we were attending in Sarasota, Florida. And I remember walking into the room and, and seeing him getting ready for church, and I, I approached him and I said, Hey, Dad, I need to be saved. And he was excited and told me, hey, let's go to church tonight. Hey, let's listen to what the pastor preaches through the Word of God. And then, in that old-fashioned, old-school altar call, if you feel like God is calling you, if you feel like God is drawing you to Himself, just grab my hand, he said, and we'll go forward. And I'll show you from God's Word what it is to be saved. And that night, I don't, I don't really remember what was being preached, but... At the end of that service, I grabbed my dad's hand and we went forward and he showed me from Scripture what it is to be saved and why I needed a Savior. Because of my sin, because of my transgression, because of my iniquity. And he showed me in Scripture what Christ did for me. That he died on the cross for my sins and for his sins and not just for our sins, but 1 John says for the sins of the whole world. And I recognized in that moment that I needed Jesus Christ to save me. And I cried out to Him and I asked Him to forgive me for sinning against Him. And I asked Jesus to save me. That next Sunday, I was baptized and I publicly proclaimed what Christ had done in my heart. But then, over the course of time, I began to be led away from my faith. I began to be pulled away listening to deceiving spirits, the teaching of demons that came in, I began to believe lies that were presented to me that I was not good enough to be saved. In fact, because I kept screwing up, because I kept sinning, was I really saved at all? And as a young boy, and then into my teenage years and into my young adult years, I remember just thinking, I was worthless. I was not deserving of the salvation that I was claiming through Christ. How could God love me? How could He save me? I'm not good enough. And I remember one day looking at a magazine and seeing this beautiful woman in barely any clothes in there. And I remember the I remember the feeling that that gave me, just that visual that look, this feeling that it gave me, the the chemical reaction that happened in my brain, it made me feel good. In fact, it made me forget how worthless and how guilty and how shameful that I felt. And not too much longer in my life, I also found alcohol and I began to drink and that also just gave me such a feeling that helped me to forget, so I began to just medicate with pornography and alcohol and became addicted to both of these things. Thinking the entire time, I wasn't good enough for Him. Believing this lie, this nonsense that had invaded my my mind and my heart. God never left me, and He never forsook me. And I remember shortly after December 2012, I remember my wife challenging me by the grace of God to stop. We needed to stop all this, and I remember God forcing me to my knees, humbling me, And I began to cry out to him and say, I just, I messed it all up. I I broke so much of my life. I have damaged so many people, so many relationships. And what could I possibly offer him? And with my arms wide open, with my hands completely empty, I went to him and just said, God, I need you to forgive me. And I need you to pick up these broken pieces and put them back together. I'm an alcoholic. I'm addicted to pornography. My life is a wreck. I'm in ruins. And God, who is faithful, forgave me. And He cleansed me from all my unrighteousness. And He picked me back up and He said, Come on, let's get going. And I just remember having this fresh feeling of what it was to be born again, what it was to be an adopted son of God. I remember just 
coming alive in Christ, really just craving a relationship with Him, craving His Word, craving to be around other followers of Jesus. And as I look back on that, I know I know how detrimental it is to be led away by deceitful spirits, the teaching of demons, really this lie. And Paul tells Timothy, the Holy Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will depart from the faith paying attention to deceiving spirits, to the teaching of demons, through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. Folks, that time is here and it is now, and that is what is happening. We can look around at the evangelical church. We can look around at uh, churches in America. We can look around at conventions in America that are being split and torn apart because of critical race theory and other false doctrines that are seeping into the church, social socialism, social justice gospel. Folks, we need to be on guard. Do you know the truth from a lie? Would you be able to recognize the teaching, the deception of a false prophet, a false teacher? Would you be able to recognize the lie that Satan is trying to plant in your mind, in your heart, so that you will be drawn away, you will be led away from, you will depart from the faith? Do you know the truth from a lie? I hope this has challenged you. I hope this makes you think. And I hope you will jump right in with us in this series and continue to really just saturate God's Word and understand what this is. Father, thank you so much for your Word. God, thank you that you have given us this Holy Bible, that you have given us your Scriptures, that you have put this together methodically, systematically, by inspiration of your spirit, you have, you have put men together to author this book and you have completed it. It's sufficient. It's without error. God, we can know the truth from a lie because we have your book. God, for so many years I was led away by the lies of Satan, tempted to run from you, a holy and just and loving and merciful and grace-filled Father. But God, you are so faithful. You never left me. You never turned your back on me. And God, I pray that even now, if there's somebody who is far from you, who is hearing this, who, is, who has been led away, who is being drawn away, who is being tempted to depart from the faith because of these hypocritical liars. God, would you open the eyes of their heart? Would you just fill them, Father, with your wisdom, your knowledge, your discernment so that they can know who they are in you, so that they can wake up and say, this isn't right so that they can repent and say, no, we're going to get back to you, God, back to your truth. We're going to stand on your word. God, would you just impact this community through Renewed Life Church? Father, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking time to watch this, share this, give it to somebody else and invite them to Renewed Life Church. All right, see you soon.